I'm cute. Dogs, there you go. I know. Sending them nice. out as we speak. <laughs> Welcome to COVID <laughs> and uh, Instagram Live. Thanks for joining us today, Helen. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for putting <laughs> all this together. Well, sure. Hey, thanks everybody for being a part of this. You've uh, joined us for the TU Science Week um, Instagram Live session. Uh, we're kicking off TU Science Week, and uh, this is Helen Neville. Um, she's the senior scientist at uh, Trout Unlimited here as part of our um, science program. And, uh, you know, we're pretty excited about what's happening this week. We've compiled a bunch of um, stories from our website. It'll be going out on our social media platforms. And, um, and we decided to start today with the Instagram Live with Helen um, uh, because she's, she's the boss. She's the <laughs> one that uh, does everything when it comes to science. And um, we're pretty excited about <laughs> this, true. Helen. Well, just, just tell us a little bit um, about you first, Helen, um, and, and what you're – uh, you know, what your interest was in science and how you ended up, you know, coming to Trout and Um, I think my early interest was because I was lucky enough to grow up in an area where I had a lot of access to the outdoors. I grew up in rural South Carolina. We live kind of in farming type um, area surrounded by woods. And I just spent all my days out in the woods. Um, and we spent a lot of time up in North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains where I literally just you know, every day spent hours and hours and hours on the creek across the street from the little cabin we had up there. Um, so that was really lucky. Both my parents were doctors. And so I was, you know, exposed to a lot of science and biology growing up. And um, just uh, we moved to Hanover, New Hampshire when I was in high school. And because of the, you know, proximity to Dartmouth College there, our biology program had a really great access um, interchange with Dartmouth and one of our teachers was able to get a lot of equipment from the university on loan to the high school students and so we were like replicating DNA and stuff you know in 1986 <laughs> when that, that technology was first just coming online so uh, one of my high school biology professors John Hutchinson was really instrumental in getting me going on biology and, and genet that's genetics in particular. And then community science is still something you're really interested in. And that sounds like that's why, because you kind of benefited from being able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great way to get uh, people's interest with hands-on, hands-on type activities. Sure. That's great. Well, we can talk about that a little bit later too, but, um, and then tell me, um, you know, how you ended up at TU and when you joined TU. Um, I came on with TU in 2006. I had done, um, you know, my graduate work, my dissertation on Lahontan cutthroat trout down in Nevada. And so through that, um, had met Jack Williams through some of our collective work on, on Lahontans. He was the former senior scientist here at, at TU and was still really involved in, obviously, native trout conservation on various fronts. Um, and at the time, I was doing a postdoc with the research branch of the um, Forest Service. One of their research offices is here in, in Boise. And so Jack and I had met up, and we were just talking about different management needs. And this position came open um, and just seemed like a great fit for me coming and how in. Long, how long ago was that that you joined? That was in 2006. And at that time, you know, our program was really small. It was uh, really just... Jack was in Oregon and me here filling that seat that had just been um, vacated. And then, you know, it was our, a Amy Hawk, our geospatial group that led the development of the CSI, had been working as a contractor, but um, it was not until a couple of years in that we brought them on and, you know, several of her staff and started to build the program here out of Boise. Great. And how long have you been the sci senior scientist? Mm, two, a little over two years. I started in April 2018. Just feels like longer, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's gone by in a flash. It's been great. You know, and I, I, well, mean, I think, you know, as part of these efforts, I, you know, I, I, I work with the staff here in Boise who have kind of traditionally been seen as our science group, but we've hired so many different scientists across the organization, you know, in the last eight to 10 years. Um, that I'm also trying to make an effort, you know, people that I don't supervise, but trying to make an effort to network us all so that we can draw on each other's expertise and collaborate more, which has been really fun. Right. We've talked about that. You know, there, there's, a, there's a team of staff in Boise um, where mm -hmm. you're located that um, is, we refer to as a science team, but there is a collective 
number of TU staffers hey. that apply science in their work. And, you know, we figured out that science community is, is pretty large. How, how many people would you say are in that for TU? I, I mean, I think now we have over 30 staff with, um, you know, various levels of backgrounds in science, masters and PhDs and science degrees, um, who, you know, people that may have been hired to do program work. So they weren't hired on as TU science per se, but uh, we've got a lot of collective expertise across a ton of different fields. Um, so, you know, just trying to tap into all of that so that we can all help and assist with TU science broadly and bring our really diverse expertise to the, to the table. It's been great. It's fun. Talk, well, talk a little bit about that diversity and, and the different ways that, you know, science, I think there's some ways of, that TU involves science that people may not think about. Um, it's not just something we do in our conservation. It's also something we do in our education program for our youth. Mm -hmm. And it's also something we do in um, the, our policy work, which is becoming Great. very, you know, uh, increasingly important. So talk about those, the kind of the different programs that we have underneath the TV science program. Yeah, we've, we've been doing a lot of support for policy work this past two years, primarily Kurt Fessenmeyer, and he's going to be on, on Wednesday, um, or I think Steve Moyer, um, our VP of Government Affairs, will be talking about the application of Kurt's work to policy, where, you know, in this case, we did a lot of, Kurt, Kurt did a lot of geospatial mapping um, of ephemeral streams to quantify the extent of these ephemeral streams, which are being, um, they're being removed from protections under the uh, Clean Water Act with the current administration. So when the administration did that, they stated that they weren't able to, to quantify the extent of these streams. But Kurt just, you know, so smartly applied available data sets. And, you know, it's not exact, but it gets us way f further toward understanding the extent of the stream miles that are being removed. So it's a great example of where science goes directly into our policy understanding of the implications um, of, of these kind of decisions, you know, and then we have a lot of, um, I think one of the, the best niches that we found out of this office in particular is developing tools um, for both our staff and angler science, community science efforts. Um, we're really engaged in that and developing a suite of different apps. Dan Dewalter and Matt Mayfield and the others here have, have developed some really nice apps for our grassroots use, like mobile phone apps. Um, to better understand impacts to streams and be able to map them as you're out fishing or when you go out on, on targeted um, trips or to understand water quality impacts and to be able to quantify water quality, uh, you know, pretty easily when you're out in the stream. And we're developing other types of technology to measure flow and stream temperature. Um, we have a great level of expertise here through Dan and Kurt in remote sensing. So using, you know, satellite imagery to understand stream habitat health. It's a pretty neat, diverse set of skills in terms of those kind of tools. Right. And that technology has, has increased. We've, you know, we've applied more of that within our programs like drone use and, and mm -hmm. mapping of potential, you know, conservation site and how to, how to, do the conservation but it also there's other things like the the um, water temperature gauges that mm -hmm. allow us to figure out where to apply the best um you know or where to apply specific conservation methods um like just planting willows it can be as basic as that but it, it goes a lot deeper than that too um what is you know like do you have a favorite part of the of the conservation of science um or the oh, science gosh. of conservation i should say i mean i i'm sure you love it all but uh, you know, maybe what you studied in school. Oh, well, I, I mean, I study genetics, so I love genetics. I think, <laughs> I think genetics is pretty cool. Um, you know, it's not the easiest thing to apply. It's not going to be a community science effort, although we do use a tool called eDNA or environmental DNA, where you can go out and collect a water sample and get genetic material from that water sample to tell okay, the species or so you, you, all, all fish, all organisms, you know, lose, shed hair or skin cells, or in the case of fish, they shed mucus and they die and they poop in the water. So there's a lot of genetic material floating around all the time. Um, it's kind of crazy to think about, but it's a huge emerging field. I mean, on a lot of different species, not just fish, but it's really useful in fish because they're pretty difficult to observe or capture, so, um, you know. So you can go in and you, you collect a water sample and you pass the water over a filter 
And then the filter basically collects all those cells. And so you can just send that filter into a lab. And um, the labs have developed various, you just have a little tiny, basically like a barcode of DNA that, that identifies the species of interest and only that species, it's, very, it's unique to a given species. And they can query that barcode off of your filter and tell you if that species was present, present or not. And it's, it's highly accurate and can be very efficient, um, you know, and a lot easier than having to lug in electrofishing equipment and having sampling permits and all of that kind of stuff. Anyone can collect these types of samples to get that information. So it's a great community science. It takes a little so that, bit of training and the equipment, obviously, to do it, but it's much more minimal than electrofishing. So that's, that's pretty useful in being able to determine if there's native species in the system, right. which is important, and also mm -hmm. perhaps invasive species that need to be removed or taken right. out. Um, so that, yeah, well, that's, that's really cool. And, so you, and you can do them both at the same time. That's the cool thing is you can, with the same sample, you can look at the, the barcode or the little identification code in the genetics for any species. So you could query rainbow trout, brook trout, and cutthroat trout at the same time, for instance. Right, right. And important stuff to know when you start mm -hmm. to do work like that. Um, well, talk about, uh, that, that's probably a good segue to, um, you know, talk a little bit about Lahontans. Um, I think most people are familiar with them being from Pyramid Lake and the giant fish that can be caught there right now. Um, but that's not the full story. There's, there's another um, side of that story that's, that's important to, to be told um, that, that uh, you and um, our Lahontan cutthroat um, trout biologist Jason Barnes are working on. You guys were out this summer doing some work with that, and um, there's somebody along with you on that that uh, uh, works for Trout Unlimited, our our own Josh Duplechain, who's who is produced a video about that. Right. You want to talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, it was really fun. Um, I mean, he had Josh had gone out with Jason, our Lahontan um, biologist, who coordinates all of the field work to be clear I hardly get out in the field which is horrible Jason does all of the <laughs> logistics of the field work um, and so he and he and Josh had gone out earlier and you know sort of done some background photography and figured out sort of the scene for this movie um, it's in a great setting it's in the Steens Mountains in Oregon just this beautiful beautiful high desert mountain range there um, where we initiated what's called a genetic rescue study a couple years ago um, the idea is that we have so many isolated populations of Lahontans, you know, they've been become increasingly fragmented by culverts and non-native fishes and um, water withdrawals and temperature. They're, they're socked into these increasingly small little fragments of habitat, which over time um, means that those small populations will lose genetic variability, which can put them at real risk in the future. You know, they're not nearly as adaptable to things like climate change or changing environment um, or disease, for instance. So the idea is that we could use genetic exchange to introduce a few individuals from outside populations to try and do what nature would have done in the past, you know, where we the ideal is that we're trying to reconnect these populations where we can and, you know, remove right. barriers and facilitate their natural movement, which is how they maintain that genetic diversity. But in some cases, we simply won't be able to do that. Um, so we're, we're looking at this in a study to try and see if it's an effective management tool. That's it's, been great. Shown in other, it's been shown in other fish. There's been a great study back east on brook trout, which I think wow. we talked about in the blog today. But um, so the, you know, the foundation has already been laid by others and it's a really nice opportunity for us to, to be able to do this. And the Steens is cool because it's kind of an experimental um, natural lab in that Lahontans were introduced into these streams that are just right next to each other in the mountain range and isolated. So they provide replicates um, where we could go and just add new fish into each stream, except for the control stream where we didn't add any fish, but kind That's of a great. natural lab. Yeah, and we'll hear more about that tomorrow and Jason's experience of um, being filmed. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's kind of, a, I, don't, I don't want to call him a hermit, but I will. Um, they, uh, um, he's, he's not used to having too many people out in the field with him. He spends so much time in the field. It's interesting and to hear his stories about that. So we look forward to Josh and Jason talking about that tomorrow. Uh, but um, tell us about your role in that. I, you, you, I think you're a little nervous about people seeing you because uh, <laughs> I heard that there was something going on with you when you went out for that uh, filming. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I was completely <laughs> hopped up on cold medicine because I had, I, 
I have discovered in the last couple of years that I have a vicious, vicious allergy to sagebrush, which is crazy. <laughs> I didn't have this until fairly recently. And so when I go out in the fall, when the sagebrush is blooming and it's, you know, head level and you're walking through it, I just was an absolute mess. So I, uh, I don't usually do this, but I had to, I was taking copious amounts of Benadryl during, <laughs> <laughs> during that film. And when Josh was interviewing me, I just remember trying to hang on to answer those questions in a lucid way. That's funny. Not um, good. Well, great. So, um, <laughs> and then later on this week, we're going to hear from, um, uh, from somebody in Alaska doing some really cool work. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Mark Hieronymus, yeah. I actually haven't seen the film, so I'm super excited about that. But um, he's just doing really important work in trying to document the presence of salmon and steelhead in Alaska waters, um, which is critical because once once they're documented, then they go in the state's listing of anadromous waters and they, they receive special protections. Um, it's real similar to our work back east where we're doing this with brook trout in our unassessed waters program. Um, but the fish have to be verified to be in those different streams before they can get re protections under the state. So it's super exciting work. And in Alaska, I mean, you can't imagine a more, you know, inspiring area to be working and going into these really remote areas to do this kind of work. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see that film. Yeah, it's 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 all amazing. And and do you um I'm just curious like how what what kind of people are are to you scientists? I mean, like what there's some characters obviously. We've kind of already <laughs> tapped on that a little bit. Um but but you know, I mean, what what is it about conservation and the the fish and you know, is it wildlife? Is there's all kinds of scientists out there. I mean, what do you think it is? that, you know, makes up the TU scientists? Yeah, I mean, we have such a breadth of different people coming at it from different directions. Um, probably the unifying thing I would say is I don't think any of us like to be in the spotlight. <laughs> 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 so doing things like this is not always what we're, what we're uh, striving for. But, um, you know, I mean, I think all, like all the staff at TU, we all are here because we're really passionate about conservation and about the resource. Um, I would say probably most of the scientists at TU are not the highest on the fishing side of the organization. You know, we've got a lot of stuff, like Mark Hieronymus, who's just an mm -hmm. awesome, awesome angler. Um, that's not typically what drew us into this. Um, really more of a passion about the, the conservation side of things and the science. You know, and it varies a lot from people who do population modeling, like Dan Dewalter, and have really gotten involved in the professional side of um, you know our professional societies like the American Fisheries Society or someone like Kurt Fessenmeyer, Matt Mayfield, who came in with the GIS background and have, have really pushed on, on those technologies or Matt Barney programming and um, drone monitoring. You know, so it's, we have a lot of fisheries biologists across the country who came at it for that, for that reason, but we have a lot of other people who have really different skills. On the conservation side of things, yeah. That's, um, yeah. And it's it's a can you explain why science is such an important part of conservation i mean i like to tell people you know um that what you know people say well what does trout unlimited do you know and well we we, we make fishing better um is kind of what my standard response is but but that's not all of this about it, that, to me trout are kind of like the um canary in the coal mine when there's issues with right. our water the fish are telling us that. And if we're taking care of fish, we're taking care of native fish, then we're also um, taking care of everything that needs water. Last time I checked, that's everything. Um, right. So, so it's important for so many different reasons than just making fishing better. Um, you know, how, what kind of other things can you think of that, you know, our scientists are doing to help that? I, I mean, we're, you know, this unassessed waters, like I mentioned, um, mm -hmm. Well, you, are, you already mentioned water quality, which is a huge part of our program, and the community science work that people like Jake Lemon and Jeff Wright down in North Carolina are doing, um, getting people out on the ground to help understand where culvert barriers are, for instance. That's a huge, has a huge effect on fish and isolating them and fragmenting in them in these populations. And in a lot of cases, we simply don't know where those barriers are. So it's a great example of where we can get people out to document that information, and then we use it in our spatial conservation planning, you know, sort of mapping out threats and the sizes of different populations across the landscape. That kind of data is really essential. But I mean, I think science just provides such an important um, framework for how we 
evaluate information. Um, it really is so ne ne necessary in identifying what the influences are on conservation to put it in a scientific framework. It just lends that credibility and helps us understand what the real influences are that are that are at play. You know, and we see in our national landscape today the 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 impact of I think our lack of trust in science and the fact that the public doesn't really I think understand the importance of the scientific process for evaluating information and you know we're all paying for that today with covid for instance. So with right, conservation right. It's, you know it's we, we simply how it can apply yeah, things like climate change and, and all of the dynamic um, influences on populations, you need to be able to tease those apart to effectively manage, right? You need to understand those processes and know how you can um, work with the fish on the landscape to, to make them more resilient. But you can't do that if you don't have a real credible framework for how you evaluate that kind of information. Right. Well, um, that's, wow, there's so much we could talk about. And that's what the Science Week is all about. Um, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions to go ahead and post them on the comments and I'll try to take a, a look and ask those questions. I did um, also want to ask about our collaboration and what, you know, there's a lot of partners that we have that we work with uh, and, and doing really important work. Um, you know, something that people may not think is too scientific, but, but to me really is, is Dan DeWalter's work with the, um, you know, the endangered assessment of the native species of trout, you know, that that's a different kind of, of application of science. And he's leading that effort. You talk great. a little bit about that. Then, yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a great example of where we have um, important relationships with the agencies and management partners, tribes, and the others that are overseeing these different species. So in this case, you're talking about the um, uh, status assessment for Apache cutthroat trout, I mean, for Apache trout, which is being, done in partnership with the collaborative group, obviously the managers, but Dan is really, I think, pulling that together in a scientific framework, um, helping them, you know, pull together the information and visualize it and understand what everybody's collective understanding is of the information and how they can make decisions moving forward. Um, and I think that's the nice thing about TU is that we, you know, we're not just academics, we're not just churning out science that's disconnected from the needs on the ground. All of our science really, um, often bubbles up from the agencies or our staff or partners. And we know when we go into a certain scientific area that it's going to be relevant because we have that relationship with managers and we can help that. That's an essential step that I think is often missed in science in helping to translate that information back into the actual conservation understanding or even management decisions for the different species. You know, not like we, we are not the managers, obviously. So the, the action on our science has to come from the different management partners. But it's only going to happen if we're able to translate our science meaningfully to those partners and work with them to create science that's relevant. Yeah. And that collaboration thing is something that really ties into to you as a whole. What you mm -hmm. know, we that's we rarely do, you know, something without the support and you know, benefit of others. Um, that's, it's, it's a key part of what trial limited is and a, a big part of what the TU science is about too. Um, right. so I don't, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions. I, did I miss some? I'm not sure. Um, well, I would say on that, on that collaboration front, another, I think, unique thing about TU science that we've only really sort of grappled with in the, or recognized in the past couple of years is that, you know, we're a little bit different than an agency or, um, you know, some of our partners in that we don't have a jurisdiction, which is nice because it means that we don't have to look at scientific questions and say, well, that's not really relevant to where we are or what our jurisdiction is. We, we really can kind of uniquely, I think, tackle these kind of questions that sometimes an agency can't, like a state agency is not going to answer some, mm -hmm. some scientific question that's not relevant to their own state, but might be important for the science. And we can help kind of unify those questions and in, in frameworks like that which is pretty neat. Great. Um, so finally, I, I will, we'll end with um, you kind of say, telling me what you see the future of trout and limited science being um, growing, engaging more, using more technology mm -hmm. as it becomes available. What, what, how do you see the science program going forward? Um, you know, I think we have a real bright future first off in just capitalizing on the expertise we have in the organization today. Um, we've been starting that effort, 
you know, over the last couple of years, first, just to even recognize who all the people were. And, you know, we have them on our website. Now you can go in and look at all of our various program and science staff's profiles and learn more about their backgrounds. And we're starting to um, put into place more structure and support for interacting with each other so that we can better collaborate with each other. And, you know, I mean, first question, when you have a question come up, instead of trying to find somebody outside is we now have a great resource for saying, hey, the other hydrologists in the organization, what do you guys do for this? Or how do I do that? And um, we're, we're just starting to have that kind of interchange, which is really fun and um, quite useful for the organization. So to me, it's going to be a matter of trying to organize our collective expertise and think about um, what the big picture questions are that you know, collectively, we might want to tackle. I think climate change is going to continue to be one of those that we've done work on in various places. You know, our shop here in Boise has been involved in quite a bit of climate re research and climate relevant research, but trying to think about that more thoughtfully and proactively and develop a, a more concerted research program around that is something I'd be interested in. And that's tied into our volunteer part of Trout Unlimited as well, because mm -hmm. there's a climate change working group that's, right. you know, that's a whole another resource for us to utilize um, experts in the field that really can contribute and have contributed to some really thoughtful engagement possibilities and, and ways to deal with things. So it's, it's, it, that's another part of TU. It's just like we're utilizing all the same parts that, that uh, the other programs use, the volunteers. Right. The, you know, it's great. It's But that's, so wonderful. that's a pretty unique aspect as well in that you know we're scientists who are connected to this incredible grassroots across the organization right so that we right. can automatically pull on the passion and the expertise <laughs> and um, the interest of a huge army of hundreds of thousands of people to go out and help us collect data when we have questions you know and so you mentioned earlier temperature monitoring for instance mm -hmm. is something that a lot of our grassroots chapters and councils are involved in um, and we're helping them in some cases organize those data and get them pulled into meaningful science. So things like the Norwest um, stream temperature modeling, out there. Right. all of the data that our chapters on the ground collect go into that model, which is a publicly available, you know, the best available data set that we have on stream temperatures. And, and we're helping to build that, which is really pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's it's all amazing stuff. I'm I'm looking forward to uh, sharing the rest of it with the, uh, you know, the world this week on TU Science Week. Well, Helen, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Brett. For your efforts. Thanks, um, thanks and, for all the work yeah, you put together this great week. Well, I think it's gonna be really fun. Well, yeah, we're excited about it. I'm excited to see these two movies coming out, and uh, hope that people connect with it. And um, I'll just say that if anybody has any questions about Trial and Science Program, feel free to reach out to me at Brett dot prettyman at tu.org and uh if i don't know an answer i'll find somebody who does uh <laughs> brett dot prettyman at tu.org thanks everybody and tune thanks. in tomorrow and you'll get to hear more about lahontans and the cool project that jason is working on and josh will be handling that one thanks you guys we'll see thanks you later thanks Helen. Take care. bye bye bye